at the top of Twitter Explore. By the way, it's Explore now. It's not Moments. Where's Moments? Are Moments gone? Seems like it. They're not using that terminology anymore, I guess. I don't know. Mm. On the new desktop. Anyway, under the hashtag icon where all the hot stuff goes, all the hot news goes, Will, we've got a story today regarding none other than President Trump, who, I mean, he said some things that have some pretty serious implications in the for the technology world, so it caught my attention. Yours as well. Uh, I mean, we've been we've been kind of covering this through a technology based lens for a while now. When the first stuff started to emerge with the Huawei ban and, of course, the trade war, and just what the consequence of that might be for the products you love, you like, uh, we're set up to have the first installment the uh, activation of these tariffs take place on September 1st, which was going to affect various products and potentially their price point to you, the end user. But then things, they just got crazy hot. I mean, things got way hotter. It's not that, it's not even that anymore. Uh, China retaliated. They go, okay, you want, you want, you want tariff us. We're going to tariff you right back. And they say, we're here's a, here. We're going to tariff 75 billion of what you're trying to send to us. Trump gets all fired up last night, and he says, I hereby order, <laughs> He said, which I don't even think he can do, but you know him. He comes out and says, I hereby order American companies to stop doing business with China. Just like that. He says it just like that. Mm-hmm. Hereby order. <laughs> just, who, how can you stop? What do you do? Uh, While eating a chicken sandwich. You got a little switch on there? You just you just flick. Is it like a light switch? It says China below it, and you just, and then yeah. your company's all set. I don't. It's not that easy. We're talking about companies again through the technology perspective. We're talking about companies like Apple, like Samsung, and others. You can't just you can't just move this stuff. You can't just snap your fingers and stop doing business with China. Now he did name a couple of companies specifically. In his tweet storm here, he named FedEx, Amazon, UPS, and USPS because he took a particular direction with his ranting. And those stocks earlier today and probably even now, they've been diving because, of course, people react. They respond to this. And that's the other end of the tech interpretation of these happenings which is how social media is now weaponized in these games, in these trade wars, in these negotiations, and in politics. Twitter, a couple of tweets, and we're, and, and, and we're, we're nosediving on the stocks? A couple of tweets, and uh, panic ensues? My goodness. Now, to, it's important to note that there's nothing official about these tweets. If he, if he says, I hear by order, it's not like, it's not like that means... That uh, from that moment forward is illegal to do business with China. No, the paperwork has not been filed. The votes did not take place. There's, uh, of course, it's more complicated when it comes to governance and so forth. But it matters nonetheless because the impact, of course, is real, is tangible. We can measure it on the stock market. And I guess in general, companies have to think, okay, if it's the president's initiative to make it difficult for me and my company to continue to do business the way that I'm doing it, I have to start to look at alternative methods. And we have tracked how some companies have already begun to do that. We referenced Nintendo and Samsung and others that began to move certain operations. That bike company we once featured here, a wide variety, in fact, of manufacturing businesses that started to make these uh, alternative plans in case he goes through or finds a way to push through some of this agenda. But I don't know to what degree he has power in this department because, for example, when China responded with the $75 billion retaliation in tariffs, he goes, okay, fine, the 10% I originally suggested on $300 billion of Chinese goods is 15% now. He said that last night. He goes, forget, forget it. And he, what is he? He's threatening to go up to 30%. Like, what is this? Can he do this? He just... Snap his finger. Well, that's a lot of power for one person if he can actually do it. I, I guess he's got the pieces in place to be able to. Uh, he got the 10% through. So anyhow, uh, 
In the meantime, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they issued a statement saying, we want to see continued constructive engagement with China. So they're like, he, they're, they're kind of saying there, like, the, the president's, he's a little nuts. They're, that's kind of what they're saying there, Will. They're like, they're like, look, we know he's out here shouting and whatnot, but, like, we're, we want to chill a little. Like, yeah. we want to. He does not reflect us. Yeah, maybe that's kind of like a way of saying that. Now, how much power, you know, how much power do they have in relationship? We don't really know. But a couple of his tweets here. Our country has lost, stupidly, trillions of dollars with China over many years. They have stolen our intellectual property at a rate of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And they want to continue. I won't let that happen. We don't need China. And frankly, would be better off without them. The vast amounts of money money made and stolen by China from the United States year after year for decades will and must stop our great American companies and hereby, are hereby ordered to immediately start looking for an alternative to China, including bringing your companies home. For the record, Will, that's all caps on the word home mm. and making your products in the USA. So this is the kind of stuff he would he typically says gets people fired up. You know, Will, it's politics. People get the retweet going. And you get at the top of the Twitter Explore page. This is how you do it. You could get there as well yourself. You just, if you had some tweets kind of like this. Yeah. You go to the top of the Explore page. You get people fired up. This type of stuff people get connected to. Mm -hmm. Bring it, bring the jobs home. Bring it home. People like that kind of a message. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an attractive message. I don't, I don't want to rain on the parade there for everybody's getting all fired up, having a little party, uh, lighting candles on the cake. It's not that easy. You can't just say that, 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 that there's no Chinese connection at all to these goods. You can't just come out here and say uh, it's a, all, all one-sided here. You can't just say, like, we'd be better off without. Like, take a look around, man. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what kind of show is this without China? You know what I'm saying? And I'm just talking about the physical products that exist and the things that I've covered over the years. The, the, the execution of these ideas, regardless of the... the uh, the, the, the place, the birthplace of the ideas and the drawings, you know, the whole Apple designed in California, made in China. Well, you got to have the made in China piece. Right. You go, you go ahead and, and design yourself away in a little room in the corner, Johnny Ive, made in China. Mm -hmm. You got to put that piece. You see how that works, Will? Mm -hmm. He probably wears a t shirt that says made in China. Who? Johnny Ive at Oof. Apple. That sounds controversial. Well, he's moving on anyway, so yeah. I guess that doesn't matter. He's moving on anyways, but I think it's just important to remember, like, this has been a collaboration for a long time, and there's been a lot of products that have come through, and I'm not trying to completely diminish. There's obviously something to it here. There's, there's a huge negotiation going on, and the impact is potentially massive, and we have a couple of tweets uh, sending shockwaves into the entire economy here. From the tech perspective, it ain't looking pretty. If uh, if you're Apple, if you're it, Apple's trying to make the case that this actually helps Samsung more than them. In fact, uh, there was a couple of articles that came out recently. Uh, Apple's lobbying Trump to back off. He says he's hearing them. Uh, you know, it, look, it's it's obviously crazy complicated, and I'm not trying to go too deep into the politics of it. That there are games being played here, and they're going to go back and forth and continue to escalate. And it's hard to imagine how that ends up working out in the long run. The process of bringing the at least the stuff we talk about here on the show. The, we had the one example of the Mac Pro, which was being manufactured in Texas, and Apple's like, no, no thanks. That was problematic for whatever reason. And they went back to China with the next version. Mm. It, it appears to be not so easy or 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 otherwise... Some companies may have approached it. Some companies may have considered it. It's just not something uh, that has happened yet, even with all of the uh, incentivization and everything else to, to, to supposedly, you know, to bring this stuff home. So when it comes to the high tech segment, there are, of course, there's always options, but the process is not just a tweet away. The process is just not a threat away. It's a long, drawn out process to be able to maneuver and shift these manufacturing facilities, systems, and so forth away from, from the current model that has been working and functioning in a similar fashion for a long period of time now. Mm -hmm. My whole life, practically, as long as this channel has existed, it's been made in China. 
Like it's a, it's actually a crazy thought to think, well, if we went through the inventory of Unbox Therapy videos and tried to pick out actual products that weren't made in China, like what would we have? Seven? Like what would we actually have? Maybe somebody wants to take on this task, but I mean, it's it's a wild thought. It's every single product has that badge on it. There's going to be a couple that are going to say Korea. We've had a couple products made in Japan. But it's pretty rare, man. So you can't just write a tweet and eliminate that, that history right there. You can't. It doesn't work like that. But anyway, he's making shockwaves nonetheless. And that's what he loves to do more than anything else. So Tariff Town. Welcome to Tariff Town. It's the future for the tech industry. It starts September 1st. There's going to be lots of products. September 1st, at least the 10% thing is approved and it's happening. Expect your tech and, and, and other things to, to become a little bit more expensive, whether that means that the company's going to, uh, that their bottom line is going to be affected or they're going to pass the costs on to you. It's, uh, that's the way this thing works. Mm -hmm. That's the way this thing goes. Anyhow. Regardless of which side you land on it, that's 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 going to be the me the immediate outcome. Uh, we got a story here. A couple people sent this one to me regarding radiation levels measured uh, on a couple of different various smartphones. Here, this story coming via Mac Rumors. Chicago Tribune claims iPhone radio frequency radiation levels measured higher than legal safety limit. So. The Chicago Tribune, they put together this test attempting to measure uh, radiation levels on some, some pretty high-profile devices dating back to the iPhone 7. They, they apparently tested around a dozen different devices from the likes of uh, Apple, but also Oppo, Vivo, a couple of other ones. And it's important to note that even though they're showing these, these numbers, these, these threat-level threat numbers... These products all passed through the FCC at one point in time in which they met the criteria. So Apple has come out. I mean, maybe I should just start with the iPhone 7 performed bad in their test. Bad in the sense that it, it emitted more uh, radiation than the federal exposure limit and quite a bit more, especially the closer it was to the body. So as you can see in this chart right here, two millimeters from the body, you had a on, on, on the first test, the standard test, as they're calling it, a, a, a readout of 7.15 watts per kg per kilogram. Uh, anyhow, that's like, it looks to be almost like something like seven times, close to seven times the amount recommended the federal exposure limit. Not recommended, legally imposed, beyond recommended. And so they did a number of different tests. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, about seven tests on the iPhone 7. And it measured above the federal exposure limit on every single test. Now, they went in and also did the iPhone 10, which was right around the line. It was slightly above uh, iPhone 8, which was above but nowhere near as much as the 7 and the 8 Plus, which was also in the OK range. Uh, the article here goes on to state that the Tribune also tested these uh, devices from these other manufacturers, and none of them were as bad as the iPhone 7, although that actually looks like the S8 is bad as well. Mm -hmm. So, although that, why do they only do one test on the S8? It's a little bit. Look, here's the point, okay? Apple disputed all this. They came out and said, look, you're, you're, you're testing methods are not official we went through the fcc they're doing it right here's their quote all iphone models including iphone 7 are fully certified by the fcc and in every other country where iphone is sold the statement said after careful review and subsequent validation of all iphone models tested we confirmed we are in compliance and meet all applicable exposure guidelines and limits so they didn't we take seriously any claims on non-compliance with the RF exposure standards, and we will be obtaining and testing the subject phones for compliance with FCC rules. What they're saying is one of two things. Your test is not meeting the criteria, which is why you're getting different results. 
you're doing something wrong with your test, or they're saying it's the one device that you have is an outlier that 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 in general they don't perform like this. Maybe there's something wrong with this device. That's Apple's statement on the matter. And 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 I would I would have to agree with them. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I have to agree with them here because. The trouble with this is you can't just test one device. I mean, I guess you can. I guess, look, it's worth the investigation. Coming from a guy like me, I'm on this side. I make videos about products. How are you? How many should you have access to? It's difficult to run a test on like 100 units, let's say. So it's worth the investigation. It's an interesting look into it. But ultimately, you're going to have to enable some agency like the FCC to do the testing themselves. Like, you can't, there's no other uh, governing body capable of, of controlling this kind of thing. They're going to have to be the ones that make the call. And if they made the call and they said, look, our test, it passed our test, and you have to assume, I, I should hope that they're looking at multiple units, not just a one-off phone, then, then, then how can you... What else can you do? How how else can you... Who, who else should be in charge? The Chicago Tribune should be in charge? Well, who's monitoring them? Who's watching The Watchmen? Did you ever see The Watchmen? Well said. I oh. watched it. Oh, okay. Yeah, been meaning to read it. Yeah, so so but. anyway, that's the argument. You can't... It's tough to have... Uh, you know, figure out which agency should be in charge of this and who should be monitoring. I think it's good that private companies are looking into it. And I'm glad that... Apple's investigating now, and they want to get a hold of those phones, and we'll see. I will say, it's important to note, when I had the whole issue with the bending iPhone, I feel like Apple was a bit disingenuous with their response to that whole fiasco because it eventually did turn into something for a lot of people in the form of touch disease, which, which meant that it wasn't like a bend to the phone to the degree which was happening in these videos, but the the uh, fragile nature of the aluminum that they were using and that slow bend over time was leading to other unintended things that were happening to those devices, which eventually led to a massive repair program. And they were like, yeah, there's like two phones that were affected. So my trust level isn't super high, but in this case, I'm kind of with them. If they pass the FCC test, what else can you really do? Because that's the governing body. That's who's in charge of tracking this stuff officially. Uh, I'm glad the Tribune looked into it, but it's just not enough data for us to really know how to interpret it. They got, I guess they got one iPhone 7 to behave this way. And you scroll down, Will, and you discovered they had an S8 behaving that way also and a couple of other devices by the looks of it. I mean, the S8 might not have been to the same extent. They have a, a Motorola device was over at the two millimeter mark. Now, I guess the other difference is that there is the there is the the two millimeter from body mark and the five millimeter from body mark. And but but then I'm I'm kind of wondering, two millimeters from the body is it's in your hand. What is your hand your body? That's yeah, kind of strange. So, so what you're not touching it because you're I mean you're always, you're using it but when it's it's touching you. It's not two millimeters. I guess, um Tight pants, jeans, really close to your body. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that's no millimeters. That's on your body. Right. Yeah, if you look at the difference with the five millimeters, two millimeters. It's huge. That's what I'm saying. What about when it's touching? Anyway, nonetheless, this is apparently an industry standard style of test. Apple's not happy with it. Uh, what do I think? Should you be worried? Should you should you put down your iPhone 7? I don't, you're probably too. You're probably, you're probably, you've probably been exposed to a healthy amount already, so I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, I'm, I am interested to see how it pans out. It's kind of cool. I don't know. Maybe it's in our future. Maybe we need to start testing a radiation level thing. Uh, maybe I'll look into it a little bit more because it, it is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the FCC has guidelines, and, and the, the question is, are, are these things that end up shipping to us far from those guidelines, or are we even capable in this type of environment of testing to the degree that they do? Maybe I'll look into it. Maybe people are interested. You guys let me know if that's something that's interesting to you. Uh, another Apple story here. At long last, will Apple drop numbered iPhones? So there's this new rumor that's emerged that 
Like we've all been calling this next iPhone the iPhone 11 or XI as the numeral for 411 because the last one was 10 and what else are you going to call it? Uh, there's been a couple reports, some speculation now that it's about time for Apple to be done with the numbers in general. Now, Will, you and I have discussed this in the past, how uh, it, it's getting a little, it's getting difficult, the naming situation. Mm -hmm. you, you and I have both talked about how cars don't have a number associated with just a model year to go with them. Uh, the numbers have been around for a while as a quick indication of which one is newer. And in technology, that's helpful, I think, for people. It has proven to be helpful. But then things got crazy because you got, first of all, you got up into really high numbers. You had number games going on where you would skip, you would have a skip, like they skipped a number to yeah. get higher, to get, you know, they got up quicker. So it seems bigger. So it seems better when compared to the competition. So there was never an iPhone 9, for example. Mm -hmm. They went to 10 and then people were like, well, it's the 10th anniversary of iPhones. So that makes sense, but it's just, this year will be the 13th generation of iPhone. So to so talk about confusing, because yeah, you had S's sure. at different times, then you had numbers. Uh, it's like, which one? Let's go one way or the other. What are we really doing? So anyway, the speculation is they move on, they get fresh, and that maybe this next iPhone is just iPhone and iPhone Pro mm -hmm. and iPhone Pro Max. And then it's up to the individual to know which year model it is. And you could continue forward from that point forward. You would just have the 2019, mm -hmm. the 2020, and so forth. And, and it, it would be up to you to know the difference. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the consumer is ready for this. We've talked about it. But if it's actually here, it'll be interesting to see what that does from a sales perspective. Because, of course, when the commercials come on TV, it's like a really big part of it. A key indication for people and i don't know i guess it's just a transition that people would have to get used to it seems to be okay for cars right but then again people hold on to cars longer don't they you're not gonna have a car you're not gonna get a new car every year most people mm -hmm. so maybe there was less of a need for that indication with vehicles that said the way people are interacting with their smartphones is changing and they're holding on to those phones for longer also mm -hmm. so now Maybe phone ownership is more like a car. We have it for three years, four years, yeah. something like this. And it becomes less important than number on it. So anyway, it's uh, it's speculation at the moment. We've, of course, talked about what to expect in, in, uh, in many ways about these next iPhones. We've showcased the upcoming camera layout. And this is going to be a substantial difference, I guess, from the previous ver uh, version, the current version. So much so that you should be able to see visually. There, there's a pretty strong visual indicator uh, from a speculation perspective as, as far as what the rear of it's going to look like. So that's helpful. Unlike an S model, Will, where it was like it didn't look like a new model, but they had to tell you it was a new model. Right. This one should be helped by the fact that it just it's going to look substantially different. So it could be a good model to just get rid of the number on if they're going to do it. But then if they want to use the same design every right. single year, then does the S stick around? So would it be, maybe that's what happens. Maybe it goes iPhone S. iPhone Pro S. Oh, I'm so, it's painful. I'm yeah, in pain. Tough. I'm in pain right now. It's really tough. I'm in pain right now thinking about it. Honestly, yeah, maybe we just get over it. Maybe we just go cold turkey. Forget about the numbers. You know what? I think it would be a courageous thing to do. And you talk about a lot about courage with Apple, you know? This would be one that would be a bold move. If they really do it, you picture that branding, you picture that commercial, just iPhone. Mm -hmm. Start fresh. Yeah. I support it if they want to do it, but I don't know. I'm not convinced yet. We'll see. Uh, Netflix is testing... Collections that are curated by humans instead of algorithms. This is really interesting. It's cool. Uh, so much of our of our uh, online lives now seem to be uh, on some sort of algorithmic rails where we're just like mm. getting jostled around. The algorithms are determining what our experiences, how our experiences play out, map out. Uh, Netflix is doing something kind of old-fashioned. And, you know, it reminded me of... 
uh, movie rental stores. You remember how you have like new releases? No, it had like the different people who work there have their picks. Oh right. Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah. I mean that we're dated now. We're old. We're a couple of old dudes. Me and Top you. Picks. Well, yeah, a couple of senior citizens. You and I. Yeah. We're sitting around. We're playing chess or something, <laughs> talking about the good old days and the, the movie rental store. But yeah, that's how they. That's something they would do. And then you would maybe have a guy whose recommend recommendations aligned well with you in the past, and he was like your human algorithm. Mm. So you would come in the store and you'd be like, okay, here's his picks. He liked The Godfather. So if he likes this other movie, I should give that one a shot as well. Mm. Now that could go any which way because that's a human being. Human beings make mistakes too, and human beings are weird and nuanced. So that could be maybe less efficient than an algorithm. So that's what makes it so surprising that Netflix is taking a step backwards in time here in having these human curated sections. For the time being, it's iOS only. That's probably telling that they're just experimenting on iOS. Some of the categories include Explore Great Britain, Real and Riveting, Find Your Next Series, Just for Laughs, Oddballs and Outcasts, Let's Be Real, Let's Keep It Light. I don't know. I mean, how do you even come up with these names over here? Short and funny. Uh, it's quite a few, in fact, and it, they're testing it out. You know, this thing could easily evaporate if it's if it has terrible performance. You know, what they have all this data on you. They're going to be able to figure out if you spend more time on Netflix navigating in this fashion versus strictly algorithmically with the current way that suggestions operate where it just says for you and it bases it, bases it off of what it knows about you. Mm -hmm. if, that if this outperforms that, you're going to see a lot more of this. But I just find it hard to believe that humans are going to outpace the algorithmic suggestions. It'll be interesting to see. That said, I do think Netflix needs to be thinking about stuff like this because I know through my own personal Netflix experiences, I feel like they're missing me on certain occasions. I feel like some of the suggestions don't line up. Maybe they're having algorithm problems. Right. And algorithm stuff is hard too. <laughs> Someone who actually works on algorithms with uh, algorithm stuff is hard too. <laughs> you know, the oversimplification. Well, yeah, of course it's hard to figure out. So uh, we'll see how the humans do up against the algorithms. It's a gigantic experiment happening over on Netflix. If you have iOS, you can jump over to your app and see if you're seeing this version and uh, and check it out. Determine if if these humans know what they're talking about or if they're setting you up for failure. Uh, remember the story we were talking about the other day about uh, Geo Fiber, Will, and how uh, our, our Indian viewers were super pumped about this fiber offering starting at 700 rupees, which is like under 10 bucks USD for a 100 megabit per second connection, mm -hmm. plus a free 4K TV. They were just amped about it. It was such a highly requested story. Talked about it on yesterday's episode. Well, I was trying to figure out, like, just how amazing is this offering comparative to what's happening elsewhere in the world? And then, of course, I happened upon this hot new article, U.S. internet pricing is all over the place. And this is coming via the Wall Street Journal. And funny enough, they did an analysis on exactly the same bandwidth, 100 megabit per second connections, which was the entry connection for the GeoFiber offering. And they found that people in the U.S. pay anywhere from $25 to $105 for the same 100 megabits, depending on where they're located and if they, depending on what promotion for whatever reason was available to them, it's a wide range. The median sits at $65, and the vast majority of the 100, and, is it 187 people? Yeah, 187 bills that were analyzed. The vast majority fall in at about 60 bucks mm. for 100 megabits. So now we have this really clear comparison. We have this really clear indication of just how competitive the GeoFiber offering is. At $9 or between $9 and $10 USD for 100 megabits, most users in the U.S. are paying six times that for the same connection. That's, that's a pretty wild difference as far as I'm concerned. Now, the reason for the gigantic range has a lot to do with the bizarre nature in which these deals are structured. 
how so different people are tied into different bundles and 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 some of these things are super regional and and different competition in different markets it's a lot going on and one thing i've recognized over the years will is that you can actually get a far better deal if you just call them up and say i'm going to quit yeah you just call them up and say i'm done with you what's it called retentions yeah then you go to a retention department and they're like oh you want to pay half and you're like, yeah. And you're like, okay, cool. <laughs> Starting now, you pay half. And you're like, wait, what? What is the profit margin on this? Because you didn't even, I didn't even tell you. I, I just, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. There, so it turns out probably the, the lesson here, at least for the US, Canada, places like this, is you probably can get a better deal. You probably should speak up and tell them you want to quit mm -hmm. and get that better deal. Uh especially if you're paying for one of the higher plans because it turns out that you know a lot of people aren't actually really utilizing the bandwidth they're paying for uh the, their actual experience like some a lot of people go I I you know I need 250 megabits and then they go and they stream Netflix every so often and YouTube mm -hmm. and they're like I just feel good having 250 megabits yeah feel good about it so presumably you're a higher margin customer. You should go in, maybe negotiate it. Who knows? Maybe you you can get a discount because there's a huge range there. You got a person paying 25, you got a, per, a person paying 105 for the same amount of bandwidth. Uh, anyway, you can go look at the article if you want more details on it. You can also weigh in because I'm curious about you guys, what your what your internet bill looks like, and also what connection speeds you're getting. You guys are a global audience, so we can get an even bigger pool. If they only did 187 people, mm -hmm. we can get an even bigger pool and get a global pool to get a better idea. There's a couple of providers that are referenced in this uh, study here. The looks like the most competitive, what is that, AT&T, $4.18? Oh, this is fees. This is something different. Anyhow, nonetheless, there's some cool infographs over there. You can compare... And you can negotiate. You can use this information. You go to your provider and be like, I was on the Wall Street Journal via Lou Later, and he's telling me there's a 100 megabit connection to be had for 25. Mm -hmm. So hook me up. I could be this person right here. That could be Big you. Dot. You could be that dot, the low dot, the smart dot. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't make any guarantees. They might tell you to go yeah. take a nap. Yeah. Come <laughs> back later. That'd be a weird thing to tell you to do, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To like go take a nap. You're like, is that a threat? It's like, huh? It sounds like a threat. Uh, we talked about that new Porsche a couple times. Porsche, the electric one, they're coming after Tesla big time, dude. And they just released the interior, photos of the interior. I think they're photos. I don't think they're renders. Images of the interior of their upcoming electric vehicle, the Taycan, Taycan, whatever you want to call it. And it looks pretty cool, man. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, there are screens galore. That one. Leave it on that photo right there. You have displays behind the steering wheel. You have a, a big display in the center. You have another big display for the passenger. Then you have what looks like a display of some kind in the, in the uh, just above the cup holders where you're going to like, where you have your climate and things like this. It's just mm. screens, man. That's the future. No knobs. I don't think there's a single knob. I don't think there's a single actual button. It screens everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Tesla went the same direction, but they have a more uh, singular approach. They have a... <laughs> I remember when I first saw the Model S, it's like, oh, you just took a 17-inch mo computer monitor right. and put it in portrait mode in the center of the, of, the, of the thing. And, of course, it's a different look on the Model 3, where it's back to a landscape, but it really, it kind of just looks like a computer monitor right slapped on there. I feel like uh, you can just knock it over. Yeah, it's just kind of hanging there. And it's there weird. goes your dashboard. It's weird to think about because I remember when I was driving that car, the Model 3, I was like, this feels futuristic because there's nothing in here. Mm. I'm just like in this in this traveling box. Almost like I could just think where I want to go and, you know, autonomous. It has an autonomous potential feel to it thing going on. But now I'm looking at that. Is it maybe too minimal? 
No. No, you I you're, you're still so. with it. I think this is the future. Now what? But but, but will that? Why why would that monitor be out like that? Shouldn't it be integrated somehow? Yeah, I feel like the monitor could be somehow better designed into the car itself. See, see, so this is what I'm saying. I feel like when you go to like ultimate simplicity land, you just go, we're going to uh, put a monitor here. Hmm. And you kind of get outside of the mentality of like trying to make it look cool or try, uh, trying to make it look luxurious sophisticated integrated what i'm trying to say is that sometimes simplicity can be a cop out sometimes you could the, you can go no 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 i'm doing this for minimalism right i hear you when in reality it can be lazy mm -hmm. like oh you just didn't want to think about it that much right like i did have the feeling when i was in there that of futuristic i had futuristic feelings but what is the future? What does the future actually look like? Is it completely minimal? Because I'm looking at this, this Porsche interior now. And I'm like, yeah, it looks kind of like an old car. But it looks like a new car too. Like there's different projections of the future, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Like which one is more Blade Runner, Will? I feel like it'd be this one. See, this one is more Blade Runner future, where the Model 3 is more Apple future. Yes, I agree with that. I don't know which one is the actual future, though. Well, I guess no one does. Everyone makes their bets, mm. and then whatever happens, happens. And we go from there. This looks very utilitarian. You know, I don't know which future I want. I think I just decided I want the Porsche future. Okay. I think I want the more complicated future not the simple one yeah more features up front you can see everything nothing's hiding here maybe it's just my science fiction upbringing you know mm. maybe it's just that this for me is seems like a futuristic poster i would have put on the wall when i was seven and the other one doesn't mm. like this seems more like a spaceship to me the, the the Porsche, Porsche? interior. Like if you had it drawn a spaceship as a kid, I think you'd be you'd be lying if you told me it looked like the Model 3 interior. You would you have drawn it like that? Uh, maybe you would have. I don't know. I guess everybody's different. Maybe on this Johnny point. Ive as Johnny a kid Ive would. might have. I don't know. There's a whole there's a whole design thing going on and there's gonna be people on both sides. I think they're both nice in their own way. Like I I'm glad that they're not identical. Maybe that's what I should say. I think they're both nice in their own way, and I'm glad they're not identical because now you have some legitimate choices, particularly in the in the electronic vehicle realm. Uh, I think this this Porsche interior looks really cool. Of course, it's a lot like the Panamera, the pre existing one. They're using their uh, some of the parts here are being from the Panamera are being used. That center display is identical. And it looks like they just doubled it up to create this really elongated, the secondary display for the passenger. That's really cool. Your pa the passenger can just be picking tunes and yeah. watching a movie. I don't, I don't know what they're going to be able to do. They haven't announced what the secondary screen would be for the passenger. Although the, it could be like a, you know, music picker. Yeah, I definitely. I see the multimedia player represented in the center there. Uh, one thing I will say, though, there are some functions in a vehicle that when you're on the digital display are slightly less satisfying, like a, like adjusting the temperature and things like this. Mm. Sliders and volume and different things where knobs are still so satisfying. I've had this experience on different vehicles. Oh, there's me in the Model 3 right there. See, that's a good time. We had a good time. That car accelerated. Uh, I drove itself sort of on the highway, not like full, full, but... It was driving. There's Willie Do in the video. So, yeah, you want to go check that video out. That's on the Unbox Therapy channel. Model 3, the car of the future. Now, Porsche got to get me the other one so I can make the same video. Right, Will? Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely. Reach out to Willie Do. Uh, this store, this product has been, has been making waves. 
I got a press release in my email inbox, and then it looks like every tech website got the same press release and went on to to, to write articles because this thing was popping up all over the place. It's a it's a air power like wireless charge mat with sixteen coils in it, which the whole it looks bananas when you see the image of the of how many coils that is. Now, yesterday we posted. I guess it was this morning, but at the time you're watching this, it will be yesterday. We posted a video on a cool all-in-one wireless charger replacement for Apple AirPower with a battery in it. Uh, I thought it was very cool. You should definitely go check that out as well. This, this one is probably a step ahead of even what Apple was prepared to make. Now, this one, it's called the Zens, is going to go a different direction with it. It doesn't have a battery built into it, but... Because it was capable of packing 16 different coils into it, it means that you don't have to specifically place your wireless charging items in a certain spot on the mat. Hmm. So they will just drop as long as you drop it on there, it's going to line up with one of the coils. So there's a couple of images here showcasing how you might have some wireless charging AirPods, wireless charging phone next to it, and they're they're not laid on there with any degree of precision. This is the ultimate version of wireless charging. Oh yeah. You just don't even think. You just drop it on. The whole table filled with coils. Yeah. It's about to blow up. Co coiled up. Yeah. So the Zen's Liberty will be able to charge any Qi-enabled device. 16 coils providing a total output of 30 watts. Also has a built-in 2.4 amp USB port, which can charge an additional device with a wire. It's made out of high-grade aluminum, and it'll be powered by its own 45-watt power adapter connecting via USB Type-C. So even though... Apple dropped the baton on the air power front. Others have picked it up, including the product we featured, the Air Ally, which I think is cool in its own right. Different approach than this, but it has the battery in it, 10,000 milliamp hour, so it doesn't even have to be plugged into the wall at times to charge all your devices. That one, perfect for travel. This one, perfect for the bedside table, the coffee table, whatever else, capable of charging multiple devices without having to line them up. People are going after it because Apple didn't. Still a very curious matter, isn't it, Will? The fact that Apple gave up on their wireless charge. Mat. You would have thought a company like that could have executed. Right. I mean, it's, it exists right now. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, they couldn't cram 16 different coils in there, 20 coils. Apparently, the rumor was that they had been trying to cram 24 coils, up to 24 coils, but it got real hot. So we'll see how hot this one gets with all the coils. It's going to be expensive for the record. Zen says the mat will be available in November for 140 bucks, and there will be a limited edition version with see-through glass for 180 That's a luxury item. That's a luxury item. But see-through glass? I mean, come on now. See, when you see it in action, mm -hmm. uh, on the coffee table, wherever you put it, it becomes a, an item you want to have out there. That's the glass one, right? There you see all the coils. You get proud of your coils. You know what that's like? Well, you know, on a, a luxury car, like a Ferrari or something, they put glass over top where the engine is. Mm. You get to see. Yeah. Ah, that's how it goes. Same here. You get to see how it goes. All right, last one for me, Willie. Do a little uh, quick chicken sandwich update. Okay. Because I know you guys are hungry out there in the world. I got to do a quick chicken sandwich update. So yesterday did not go as planned. In, in yesterday's episode, I was talking about how this, this Popeye's chicken sandwich, it's all the rage. It was trending. Everybody needs to know about it. Uh, they're going after Chick-fil-A. It's the hottest sandwich. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pop by Popeye's and give it a shot and see how it stacks up to every other chicken sandwich I've experienced in my life. And uh, to my dismay, I discover, not you know, prior to going there, that this new Popeye's chicken sandwich did not launch in Canada at the same time as the U.S. It's probably coming, but they're having difficulty even keeping up with the demand in the U.S. The, 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 chicken, the Popeye's chicken sandwich is so popular, Will. Mm. Now, if you click on that article at the top, Popeye's new chicken sandwich, not in Canada... This individual, Melanie Woods, she went ahead and tested the chicken sandwiches that are available. Of course, we have the Wendy's chicken sandwich. A&W has a chicken sandwich. McDonald's has chicken sandwiches. Tim Hortons has a chicken sandwich. 
She didn't try the KFC, though. She didn't try. Oh, no, I think she did. I think she did. Oh, she did. I okay. think she did try KFC as well, which I feel like KFC should be getting a lot more mention in this conversation of the chicken sandwich wars, which are popping off, as I've referenced in the past. Okay. She gave four to five stars, which I just, I don't know. I don't feel like she gave enough credit to the KFC chicken sandwich. Nonetheless, I come to find out the Popeye's new chicken sandwich is not here yet, so I cannot interact with it. Also, Chick-fil-A has not opened yet, although apparently it's set to open like any day in Toronto. So I'll be there. Don't you worry. I'll have a report back on the 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 original, the champion, whatever you want to call it, the Chick-fil-A. It's supposed to open in August. There's not even many days left in August. So anyway, I'll, I'll be there. I'll check it out. But for the time being... I couldn't leave you guys hanging. So I went for the Wendy's chicken sandwich. Now, Wendy's was the one that turned it into a full-out war because they came on Twitter and responded to people talking about the Popeye's chicken sandwich and said, oh, uh, you guys can fight over second place, Popeye's and, and Chick-fil-A, which is like, did they have a right to even say that? So I had to go get to the bottom of that. So I went to Wendy's. And I got the chicken sandwich recommended by the individual from the HuffPost article, Melanie. If you go back to that article, she gave the Wendy's chicken sandwich, I believe, the highest rating of all the ones she had. Where is it? I think you have to scroll to the bottom. I think she left it at the very, very end there, the very end of the chicken wars. She gave it one, two, three, four, five, six out of five. Six chickens out of five on the Wendy's Asiago Ranch Chicken Club. She claims it's the best chicken sandwich on the market in terms of major fast food chains in Canada. And I just had, I went out and got it, okay, because I'm like six out of, she gave it higher than the KFC Big Crunch, which I feel like should get more credit. I'm going to redo, I'm going to have another taste of that because I feel like it should totally be in a conversation. I had this chicken sandwich, Will, and you want to know something? Hmm? Eh? It's okay. Eh? No big deal. Ah, you know, it wasn't that special to me. This one right here? That's the one I had. The one she recommended, I'm sure it's available to a lot of people in North America. You can go and get one of these. Not that it's bad or anything, but I just was like, she ranked that one above all those other ones? I'm like, maybe Canada needs a serious chicken sandwich disruption. Maybe Chick-fil-A is going to just demolish the marketplace here and Popeyes is going to have to get that new one here sooner than later so I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to go to KFC before the next episode I'll get the big crunch and I got to hit the reset button on my own exposure because it's been too long I have been out of the chicken sandwich game I didn't even know the Wendy's one wasn't going to be that exciting I didn't know so I got to go have that one as soon as I mean, it's any day now the Chick-fil-A opens. I'll try that one. And then Popeye's has to speed up, and I'll let you know what's actually going on. What I think the real story here is that people are sleeping on KFC. Mm. I think that's the real story. It should be in the conversation, and that should be what's going head-to-head. -head. It should be KFC versus Popeye's versus Chick-fil-A. The chicken specialists are all going to have the best play, in my oh, opinion. Oh, jeez. And there's a couple of local ones. I got to give a shout-out to Chuck's Chicken locally. They got a chicken sandwich. And Mary Brown's as well. So there's other chicken sandwiches locally. I'm going to examine. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Now, you have a story today, Will. You got to get to something. It's been too long. We need a year. Hear about what Willie Do's thinking. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, so this is uh, T-shirt making. What do you know about DIYs? <laughs> you, you're telling me <laughs> you get the opportunity here today. Eh. And this is, this is where you take us? Well, I mean... This is the stuff that I think people would appreciate watching this. So it's a YouTube channel called How to Make Everything. And the title is How to Grow a $5,000 T-shirt in Only Three Years. Did you say grow? Grow, yes. Continue. So this one man, he actually, He's only one man? Yes. He's just one. Single. Is he um, a guy like you, Willie Do? Kind of. He's like a regular guy. He's, he's, I like know, that. Just making his way through life. I, li I like that. He's yeah. living life? Yeah. I like that. Uh, growing t-shirts. He actually grew t-shirt, like a t-shirt, through planting cotton plants 
on his backyard, you know, and then actually harvesting these cotton plants and then going through the process of like building a thread machine, um, harvesting those those cottons to build a thread, Whoa. building a looming machine to actually build like a canvas for the thread. And he actually like screen printed, made like certain types of um, ways to color it. Like it, it, this this whole process was really amazing to me. Like there was all these like triumphs and defeats. His uh, his plants got like you know over flooded, so he had to move the plants again. And you know it was like the winter time, and he went through like all these different troubles, like trying to figure out like how this whole process works. And um, he actually got a little help from builders to build like these machines uh, the looming machine the threading machine but basically this whole process of building an actual t-shirt so from scratch so the the reason for the title is because he invested five thousand dollars over the course of the project yes oh my and like i think over two thousand hours of his time did he include that in the five thousand bucks, or it's five thousand bucks and two thousand hours? Um, I don't think it it included the labor. Wow, I don't think so. That's wild. But like, so what's he, he is he gonna try to sell T-shirts or how does he just just to build this one shirt <laughs> from scratch? And he went through all the process of like I think the most interesting part is um, making the color. So he got some turmeric plants that he grew himself <laughs> to make the color yellow. Um, he took, I think, uh, beetles, like some kind of um, some kind of bug to get the color dye red. Wow. So when, you, when he says grow, he means grow. Straight up grow. He means yeah. grow. Yeah. You know, can I just say something? You know what strikes me watching this video? How amazing cotton is. Mm-hmm. Like, holy do i undervalue cotton i wear cotton every single day and i don't appreciate it enough because you show me those plants and i'm like whoa yeah that's right that plant has this incredible fiber come out of it that we all wear mm -hmm. show me a person who doesn't wear cotton mm -hmm. on one article of clothing it's amazing nature yeah. farming I love it. <laughs> it's a great time, Will. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting walk. What would I, I wear? Totally recommend it. What would I wear without that plant? Uh, yeah. Polyester? Am I? I'm sweating and. Yeah. My goodness. Anyway, uh, but, congrats to this guy. Yeah, so he finally did it after. He's three gonna years. need more than three hundred twelve thousand views to make back this five these five Gs. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so and go go give him life. a watch. Uh, watch the pre-roll ad. Uh, oh, he, oh he'll, he'll sell you one. Check out Mel Chemistry and get 25% off. So he will sell you one. Not not the one that he makes. No, no, no. But think. you you can support but, yeah. him in some way. Yeah, yeah. yeah you appreciate Definitely. what he's up to. So shout out how to make everything. Cool idea as well for a channel and a channel name. Big fan of that. You got to make things, Will. Right. You got you got to make something. Uh, you know what you got to do? You got to... You got to go outdoors and you got to make something. I think those are the only rules. Oh, and you got to treat other people the way you'd like to be treated. Yeah. That's it. Those are the rules. Mm -hmm. It's all you need. Those three. Beautiful story. Well done, Willie. We Shout covered out. it all. Another day, another chicken sandwich. I'll see you on the next one.